Hey everybody, welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers Podcast. I have such a great guest for you today. His name is John Petta. He's the Vice President of Quality and Operational Excellence with Molex. Molex, you may be very familiar with, or maybe you haven't heard of them because depending on your industry, it is a $9 billion manufacturer of a whole range of different components. And uh, John has a tremendous uh, interesting stories in terms of all of his experience, both where he is with Molex and his background at many other outstanding companies, including General Electric. So I can't wait to dive in. John, welcome. welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I'd love for you to add uh, anything else you'd like to add about your background that the listeners might be interested in, as well as just a little bit more about Molex for anyone who may not be familiar. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the, that nice introduction. Yeah, yeah, Molex is, yeah, it, it very much is a company that uh, many people are very familiar with and some never heard of it. However, our, our, our uh, products and units are in almost, uh, are in many things you use uh, throughout your day, including smartphones, uh, your automobile connected, uh, connected to the, to the 5G, uh, con- connected health as well. So the company itself is, uh, been around for about 80 over 80 years and it is about connections the the connectors be to electronic connectors from one unit to to another high performance cables in data centers and so forth so uh, a very well known company within the connector business awesome and when we talk about quality um, the first thing one thinks of is measurements data you know yeah. determining whether you're getting the right quality off manufacturing production, uh, highest possible yield, things like that. So I know data is a big part of your life. And of course, data has become, not that it wasn't always important, but an ever more important part of every aspect of business in this increasingly digitally centric world. So I'd love to just start by talking a little bit about um, the role that data plays in your life today. And and even, I know we've talked about some great stories uh, in terms of how you've used data to make major business breakthroughs. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I when I came out of uh, engineering school, I had an undergrad in mechanical and a graduate in biomedical. Um, I was familiar with data, but not how powerful it was. Until uh, once I got out of um, undergrad, I went to General Electric in their healthcare medical systems was title at the time, uh, and, and I worked there for several years. And then I was tapped on the shoulder, and this is kind of started the journey of how important data is. I was tapped on the shoulder and said, Jack Welsh would like to start this new program called Six Sigma. Um, But he'd like to have about 13 people to try it out to see if it works, as the methodology works, will it solve problems, what kinds of problems will it solve, will they only be in manufacturing, engineering, or could it be span all the functions and divisions of the huge Corporation of GE. So he picked uh, 13 people to try this, and I was one of the 13. Uh, and it was just a tremendous opportunity from a career standpoint, tremendous learning. The, the other 12 people uh, that we were titled Black Belt at, at the time, uh, and that was a new, brand new title. And I remember my first question when senior management asked me, it was like, well, is that going to be on my business card because I've never heard of that as being an actual title in business. And yes, it was. And there's going to be master black belts too that will help you with the, your statistical analysis and so forth. And it was, an, an incor- it was a tremendous team. I'm still friends with many of them. Uh, and we didn't know at the time how really we were blazing trails here. And we were, it was exposed to us how important it is, not just data, but the right data and make sure the data is accurate, that your measurement system that you're trying to solve for gives you data that is, is accurately measuring what you ever want to measure. And our motto was, in God we trust, all others bring data. And that really was kind of the importance. It, it started open my eyes to the importance of this data. Um, and the first question was, you know, what are you trying to find out? And then you ask yourself the data, not, oh, I have all this data. And you can imagine that a company is, you know, really cutting edge as GE is, especially in uh, medical systems, there was data all over the place. Well, well, just because you had data doesn't mean it's useful or accurate 
or helpful. So you really have to ask yourself, what are you trying to solve for? What are you trying to answer? What are you trying to find? So needless to say, with, with our, our projects, we started out with, we were solving some fairly significant issues that had been problems for a while. And we had a, a tremendous track record of success adhering to that Six Sigma methodology. Um, the first project I was on was trying to solve for uh, uh, one of the subsystems in the CT unit, computer tomography unit. And I'd worked very, very well with the chief design engineer for that tremendous engineer, fantastic. Uh, and we were trying to solve for this before we were starting to analyze the data. He assured me it's definitely not here. So don't even bother looking there at that elements of the design. And then once I started looking at the data, it pointed me right to that as being the issue, which is why it was an issue for a while, because everyone thought it can't be there. And a the data said it is absolutely there. We, Without getting into too much details, we adjusted the design, solved for that, and the problem went away. So from that, it really showed you the power of the data if you can make sure the data is accurate and that you're answering the right question uh, that you're trying to solve for. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. And I've seen this pattern over and over that it's like what you said, oh, you know, in God we trust, all others bring data, data. One of the things that people often trust are these sort of apocryphal, oh yeah, everybody everybody knows X, right? Everybody, everybody knows, knows it. The yeah. customers don't care about this or their priority is that or everybody knows this is our highest value customer or whatever else. And then you're like, well, where's the data to support that? Sometimes people haven't even measured it because, well, we not going to bother measuring that. Everybody knows it. Right. <laughs> go, Why waste our time looking at that? <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, sometimes, of course, you go measure something like that and it turns out, yep, yep, the thing everybody knows is actually true. But it's always fascinating and super valuable when you realize, wow, this is a myth, <laughs> this thing that everybody yeah. believes to be true. Sure, sure. Well, and then what was interesting about that, too, and how that helped us with our customers is once we had success and it was, you know, obviously Six Sigma is, is a great problem solving methodology and it spread throughout uh, GE. We ended up that group, we ended up designing and writing all the training materials for, for GE. It spread out very successful. Um, I became a master black belt, love tra training people, explaining this and really looking forward to, you know, what kind of, the, the people in the classroom, what kind of problems do they have and the different functions that were GE in and how would we solve for that? And you just learn the flexibility of it if you stuck to the methodology. Well, with that success then, the thought was we can take this to the customers and we can help our customers with their problems. You know, and, and what, a, what a great differentiator from a, our competition if we can help our customers with their problems. So. So uh, I worked with a few others and we started this this business within GE of going out to hospitals and looking at their processes and using data to analyze their processes. And again, incredible learnings on what the data will will help you uh, solve for. One of my biggest, one of my first biggest projects was throughput through a radiology department. And what's the one thing you see in a radiology department is a waiting room full of people, right? So I started analyzing this data and breaking down, okay, process map, all the steps it takes to full, to deliver its solution, which is a, cl you know, a clinical paper. And here's, here's, here's a clinical decision based off of this, this uh, patient. As we analyze that, now we in GE had thought, well, everything that works in a radiology department is centered around our equipment our x-ray machine, our CT, our MR, that's the center of the process. Well, the data said not, not necessarily. And we had, Jack Welsh had, had pulled together. He, ca he, he came into GMED Systems. They were having a board of directors. And he wanted to meet with, he, he picked about 12, what he thought were fu future leaders of the business and what they're doing to apply Six Sigma. And I was one of the 12 chosen, and we uh, through it was a incredible meeting you had, Jack, and this was right at the height of, he was hitting on all cylinders, GE was doing incredibly well, and he had his whole staff in this room with us. 
and then the entire staff at G Med Systems senior executives, and then the 12 of us. And it was a room with the tables on four sides, open in the middle, and we would go around and the 12 of us would explain what we've done, what problem we solve for. And you really had to be careful with Jack Walsh. He didn't suffer fools lightly. And he could, he was an incredibly intelligent man, engineer background, so he really knew how to analyze data um, quickly. So there were challenges uh, throughout the, the uh, discussion. And the last one to speak, uh, it was getting near the end of the meeting, was myself, and I hadn't spoken up yet. And it was a pause. And I remember saying to Jack, I, I said, just out of the blue, well, Jack, I really think we have to relook completely how we approach our customers and what's important to them. And I kind of paused there. And I mentioned the four-sided table. Jack was in the middle on my side, and there were two gentlemen between me and Jack. And after I said that, which is quite a bold statement, the two other managers kind of pushed back, you know, not to get in the line of fire, knowing, like, okay, <laughs> you don't throw a bold statement like that and not be able to defend it. So there's going to be some discussion going back and forth. So Jack had paused, and he kind of looked over, and he said, do you want to expand on that? And he looked at my name tag, John. You want to expand on that, John? And I knew at the time, you know, careers have pivot points, you know, where they go left or right. And I knew what I was going to say in the next couple of minutes were going to determine whether it was a good career move to say something that bold or not. And I said, well, Jack, I said, we think in a radiology department, that everything's centered around our equipment because it, it, it's expensive. And, but if you look at what they're trying to do, again, that clinical decision, they are, they're, they are capped in reimbursements. So patient throughput is everything. And you look in the waiting room and there's all those patients willing to pay for a radiology scan. And yet if you go in the back where the equipment is and you stand behind the council of the tech who's running the equipment, you'll notice that equipment is idle the majority of the time. So here you have this equipment, you have this backlog, and it's all about getting patient throughputs on and off the table. And I said, if you look from the time it takes from scheduling a patient till that clinical uh, decision is made, only 10% of the time is GE's equipment being used. The entire cost of that, only 25% is the equipment. It's all about getting the patients on and off the table quickly and utilization of the equipment. And I said a couple, a couple more things to it, but that was the gist of it. And I paused and then, and I mentioned, you know, the data, the analysis, it's all in that binder in front of you and you kind of page through it. He took it, he threw it on the table. He says, John, you just blew my mind. And across the way was Jeff Emmelt, who succeeded him. And that was when he was right at the right before Jack was going to retire. And Jeff kind of smiled. He says, yeah, that's some of the things we've been talking, mentioning to you, Jack. So um, it turned out to be great, was a great career move. Luckily, and I wouldn't have said it if I didn't have the data and confidence in the data that it was right. Um, and it's not very often that Jack Walsh says, you, you, you blew my mind. Yeah, so, amazing. And it was all data-based. Hope you pop some champagne on that one when you got home. I did breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's an amazing story. And uh, before you did that, what was your – were you nervous? Were you confident? What? How did you feel before you, you took that bold step? Curious. Um, I, I Confident but also nervous. You're in a room like that. And, uh, you know, it was, it was early in my career. I was, you know, st still fairly young, but I, I – I had confidence in the methodology that we use. I had confidence in the data that we had, that it was accurate. You know, I double checked it. I thought it, it told a compelling story, something that senior executives should know about. Um, but you're in a room like that with, and it was his whole staff too. So, you know, there, it was quite a powerful room. Uh, so that's a little bit intimidating, but again, if, if you have confidence that, you, you got the truth with the data, 
and the analysis is solid, you know, and he, he didn't mind being, nor did any of them really mind being challenged. Just know your stuff. They'll mm-hmm. challenge you and you, ch- you challenge back. Here's why I think that. Here's the information why I think that. Here's the analysis we use to come up with that decision. And, uh, and they were open to it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And um, was creating that sort of consulting unit within GE, was that, was that a new, I mean, obviously GE, predominantly a manufacturing company, a product company, was that a completely new thing or was that something that had been being done in a lot of different areas or were you really blazing new ground in terms of saying, hey, we shouldn't just be selling stuff to our customers, we should be charging them for our consulting? Yeah, it, it was new. It was, we were blazing trails. We, we knew the value and when we, with the different projects we had and that it worked on so many different projects from so many different functions and divisions, the usefulness of that methodology was so apparent that it's like, well, why wouldn't we take this to our customers? This is of value. We can share value in a different way in a, di- in a newer market with our customers. Yeah. And now Six Sigma. So, I mean, that's an amazing thing to have been one of the fir- first 13 Six Sigma black belts. Um, I Googled it before our uh, talk, and I don't know if this is accurate, but I, one Google thing said that there's something like 250 to 350,000 black belts that have been certified to date. So yeah. you are the, the leading yeah. tip of, <laughs> obviously, a yeah, major was, movement. Yeah, it's why I tell people I mentor throughout my career. It's, you know, if you can early in your career, uh, and even beyond that, take a risk. Find out, you know, where's a new area that, that the company could be expanding in or learning in or transforming into. Uh, take that risk. Be be one of those pioneers in that, that area. And that's that served not only myself, but people I've mentored over the years so well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious, if we think about Six Sigma, obviously it was a major force in business transformation. Today, I'm curious about how you feel about its applicability. I think on the one hand, the focus on data, you know, we, we've never lived in a moment where data was more central to so much yeah. that is about succeeding in business. The focus on quality, and it's such a high level, obviously that's the fundamental name of Six Sigma implies, I forget exactly how many nines, the 99.999% or whatever it is, but we almost see a, a countercurrent to that where companies have to transform rapidly, they have to innovate, and there almost seems to be sometimes a message that I'd be curious to know if you feel this is really a contradiction, but can seem contradictory that says, hey, you know, we need to move quickly. You know, Guy Kawasaki wrote a book years ago, Don't Worry, Be Crappy. We have the idea of the minimum viable product. You know, right. we need to ship ship fast, fail fast. You know, this idea that maybe we shouldn't be quite as obsessive about quality as a Six Sigma mindset because we need to be able to get things moving more quickly. Do you think those are contradictory? Is is that a, a new trend or how do you see those two things juxtaposed? Yeah, good question. I I, I think you have you pick the tool given where the problem is and what, what you're trying to solve for. So today, speed is so important. You know, having, uh, having information digitally is so important because you can make rapid decisions if you have the right data in front of you. So I, I think it's a tool set that is still very applicable. There's a tool set when you, when you have time to do that type of thorough analysis, perhaps in product development, uh, or if you're trying to solve an existing problem. But if you look what came right behind that was Toyota production systems in lean manufacturing, um, which that was actually the next initiative that many of us, starting Six Sigma, uh, put that initiative in place and developed that within GE. And that is really about, there's so many things with lean and operation excellence, it goes by many names, it was really about getting key data to people who it will elicit a response to, like visual management on a shop floor. You take the data, what data do they need? All right, you don't, they don't need a lot of data, there's a few key metrics, have that very, very visible on the shop floor, and then they can quickly see that and elicit a response and quickly react to solving what may be trending towards an issue or what may be an issue right now. So I see it the same. It's using data. It's a different tool set. 
you get to a conclusion quicker. And a lot of times maybe you, you don't need a deep thorough analysis of it. You know, if, if uh, you're supposed to get 100 units out an hour and you're getting 80 out an hour, right, you don't have to analyze that. You, you got a problem. You, you got you to gotta close that gap of 20 units every hour. Um, and I just see that that's a way of speed. And now as we work to digital transformation, now you can get more predictive. So you're looking, bef you're looking at trends before they become a problem and you try to solve beforehand so you never get to a defect, however you define defect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I think these things are synergistic. Yeah. Um, the uh, One of the things that that relates to is something you and I have talked about in the past, which is KPIs. It's one thing to have you know endless amount of data, which largely speaking is good because you have the opportunity to get information on lots of different things. But from a management perspective, when you start to measure uh, employees hold them accountable to certain metrics. I know you and I have talked about the fact that uh, GE, Jack Welsh famously would pick a very small number of KPIs that he would hold everybody yeah. accountable for. And I know you've worked at other companies where there was a plethora of KPIs. You know, the, the fact that you had so much data meant that perhaps it was um, tempting to measure people by all those KPIs. I'd be interested in your thoughts about, um, about that and dichotomy and, and what you've experienced and, and what you think it's always tricky, I find, to find the right the right number of metrics. If you measure everybody by one thing, inevitably you get unintended consequences, right? If you only measure profitability, you get all kinds of negative long-term things. On the other hand, if you measure people by 100 things, I've, I've been in roles like that and it's just totally confusing. It's almost like you're not being measured by anything because who can pay attention to that many things? So what's your thought about, about that whole issue? Yeah, um, yeah, and you're, you're right. You look at, at Jack Welsh, he was running that, uh, entire corporation he had th at three to at most five metrics and they may train change and evolve from one year to the next but that's what he really focused on and the thoughts are he would get 90 percent uh, 80 to 90 percent of what he wanted out of three to five metrics so you know that that that's probably a good focus um, but I it also spent time at another good company Amazon where there was over 200 metrics we'd be measuring on, on a daily basis uh, which it w was quite difficult to manage because you you could have you know 208 of those 210 metrics right online and and two would be off and you'd have to answer the next day to the two that were off and uh, it, it it was difficult to keep that many metrics on and, and Amazon's a company that uses data very well that they, they've designed their processes and I'm talking mainly about their fulfillment centers having very good data. Uh, real time for their whole for their whole process. So, um, but with that, you can take that data and analyze it many many different ways. And that was a, that was a little daunting to try to manage 200 plus metrics. Yeah. Uh, but I I do think uh, I I am still of the opinion that pick a, a few, really focus on that, and they may change. They may they change over time. They may change over what your customers need or your your market demands, uh, but really focus well uh, on just a few half dozen, you know, maybe up to ten, and that will get you well, well on your way to eighty percent of what you want your team and your and your teams to focus on. Yeah, I'm curious if you remember back when you were with Jack Welsh. I assume that of those metrics, a few were things like revenue and EBITDA, mm -hmm. but what were the other beyond the sort of key metrics that almost any company has to measure on? Do you remember what are some of those other metrics, or what are the, what were some of the ones that kind of came and went? Yeah, there would be metrics on. He would usually have a few of those metrics, uh, one maybe two that dealt with a culture change. He may want, mm -hmm. all right. Like workout was very big. Trying to analyze what we're doing, and just with a, a company that big, there was a lot of waste and inefficiencies. So there's a program called Workout where you'd actually analyze what you're doing. It's like, hey, why are we doing it this way? You know, we've been doing that way for 15, 20 years. Uh, we don't need to do it that way anymore. Let's change it to something more streamlined, more effective, more efficient, and that would be Workout. So he, he wanted to, and that would pivot a lot of the leaders and managers and employees' headsets towards looking at that. So how do you take a corporation, you know, with, you know, 100,000 100, plus employees and get them focused on things like inefficiencies. And it was a great way to do it. 
how many people went through workout training, all right? How many um, events did they have to pull out efficiencies? And that would help move the culture of a huge corporation by having that one of his key metrics. So it really depended on, you know, if he wanted innovation, there might be, you know, a market expansion metric uh, involved as he wanted certain certain businesses to really expand. So it, he, he thought and worked with his team uh, very hard on what those metrics will be because of the impact of such a few would really determine where everyone's focus up was yeah. for the corporation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember like, I mean, for example, 3M famously has that metric of yeah. what percentage of their revenue is coming from products invented within the last few years. I forget exactly, exactly. how many years the It's a the great metric. Is. It yeah. keeps innovation yeah. rolling. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Well, in our last few minutes, I, I can't believe we're almost out of time here because it's been so amazing and you have such incredible stories. Um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about how quality has changed. I know a lot of your focus now is on manufacturing quality and you, you alluded earlier to some elements of digital transformation of quality are about trying to prevent rather than just detect defects in manufacturing. What do you think are the most exciting and interesting trends in terms of the, the digital the impact of digital on your ability to make sure that whatever is being manufactured has the right level of quality, and and I should add, is digital also doing anything that makes it more challenging? I mean, as you're as you're turning out more and more sophisticated electronic components, for example, that I'm guessing have even higher demands on them, does that actually create more complex demands on quality? Yeah, it's uh, we're at it. We're at a really exciting point within Molex right now. We are going through a complete digital transformation where we're taking all of our business processes and digitizing them. You know, PLM, ALM on product development, MES in manufacturing, looking at digitizing our complete uh, uh, GSNOP, our customer experience. And we're building that foundation and, and the, uh, the capabilities that unleashes is really, really exciting because it's allowing us to be far more predictive, even in terms of quality. So now you have you have your PL, PLM and and the design FMEA tied to your MES and process FMEA, tied to how your yield is on the shop floor, tied to how your product's performing out in the field, close loop back to the design engineers uh, and adjusting the CTQs, uh, it's, it finally gets a closed loop predictive quality model that we've, many, uh, most of us in the quality world have wanted for years and years. Uh, and we're putting that in place in Molex. It's quite a transformation. It's quite an investment, but the, the value that this is going to bring to us, our customers, our speed to market, our speed to ramp uh, new products because several of our, many of our products are with customers who time to market is of the essence. Um, and we have to get those launches right. We have to get the quality and the yield right. Um, and this is allowing us to do this, build that digital foundation, then link all the, the business processes together. Um, I think it is take, it will take quality to a level that are, the customers just haven't seen. There's been great work done in the past by many companies on improving quality and containing quality within within their entities so that their their customers may not see it, but that can be expensive to contain quality. This, with a predictive model, connected all the way through the product life cycle, now those, you don't, there aren't issues to contain because you, you, you don't create defects. You see where your processes are starting to go uh, out of uh, out of spec, and you solve those right away. Yeah, and so can you just talk a little bit about what some of those specific technologies are? I imagine things like optical image recognition to see things, uh, Internet of Things, um, sensors that detect. Can you just give a little more detail for those that may not be familiar with the ways, the types of things you're incorporating into manufacturing? Because it's sure, really fascinating. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it is very heavy in the, the IIoT, the tied to our machines, machine language. What information can we pull from our machines? Um, our, our machines tend to be very high volume. 
uh, stamping and so forth. So the, the challenge is how do you get a measurement on something that you're producing hundreds and hundreds of units a minute on? And how do you get that, that type of measurement? And not only that, how do you handle the data that comes off the machine at that, at that rate? And, and that's the challenges we're solving for right now. Now that we know what information we want, how do you, how do you structure your data? How do you collect your data? How do you filter your data to what you're looking for and then analyze your data and keep that real time and keep that connected to the people on the shop floor, you know, on their mobile devices, uh, that they're getting that type of a, at least a dashboard from that data lake of all that information. Very, very exciting time, but you really need to have some good data scientists. You have to have a very good tech team that understands system architecture because you are pumping data through a system that you've you n never thought possible, but you need that. You, you need that to, to be predictive in your quality. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Very, very exciting time, and it's so fascinating. I've had the opportunity to see some manufacturing facilities recently that are really very advanced in the regards, and I'm sure like yours is, and uh, it's just really inspiring to see some of the really innovative ways that digital is being applied to, you know, very super high frame rate. I don't know if this is what you, super high frame rate photography so that stuff can yep. be looked at, yep. you know, and then image recognized immediately, even though it's, it's only a, a thousandth of a second image and things like this, that's being immediately image recognized and seeing if there's a quality issue. And then they know exactly which unit that was that came off the line that has that problem. I mean, it's just, it's just fascinating yeah. stuff. It is. It's uh, and, and uh, again, you, you really have to have good, data scientists behind you, how to capture that data and describe what you just said, which is accurate. That's what you're trying to get to. Yeah. Uh, but with so much information, you almost get back to what we started off saying. If you have all this data, it doesn't mean it's useful. It doesn't mean it's accurate. It doesn't mean it's helpful in solving problems. So what data do you need, especially now in this digital world where there's information and data everywhere? Yeah. All right. What do you, it uh, goes back to, what are you trying to solve for? Yeah. What are you trying to, what question are you trying to answer? And speaking of questions you're trying to answer, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of these same technologies that are being applied for quality, the same technology also has a safety component. And the yeah. same sensors are being used to both gather information about product quality and ensure that there's not some sort of incident that could potentially occur that endangers the lives of people working on the shop floor or manufacturing Indeed. floor. Some mm -hmm. very interesting stuff. Great, John, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. I want to give you the last word, anything you want to say to wrap up or any place that you'd like to send people uh, that you think they should check out about your company or anything else that you're doing, uh, anything you guys want people to know uh, as a final word here. Yeah, um, Molex is part of, of, of Coke Industries and I one of the great, one of the many things I think that makes Coke Industries and Molex great is our, our MBM principles that Charles Koch developed, the market-based management. It is a terrific tool set on how to manage uh, a team, how to be part of a team, how to transform a business, and how to bring value to your customers and your employees. Um, I would encourage uh, anyone to pick up one of Charles's book on MBM. It's a fascinating read, uh, and it is one of the key of is probably the main key to success within Coke Industries. Cool. I will uh, we'll put the link to that, the Amazon link in the uh, show notes, and, and thank you for that. John, thanks so much for being here. I've been speaking with John Petta, the Vice President of Quality and Operational Excellence at Molex, $9 billion manufacturer of all kinds of components, as he said, in probably lots of things in your home and your automobile right now. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you, as always, for watching and listening to the Winning Digital Customers podcast. It's been great spending this time with you. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, keep transforming.